Hello, everyone, and welcome to another beautiful Thursday morning. You're listening to Bhavani at IE Green on the Progressive Radio Network. And I'm thrilled to be here with all of you today. My guest will be Kendra Pierre Lewis. She is the author of Greenwashed and Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet. And I'm really excited to have her on, and she'll be coming on in just a little bit. But first, I want to share with you some things going on in and around the news. Um, some ways that you can take action and get involved and um, of course share with you my weekly recipe. So um, first um, I wanna just let you all know that I am continuing to do my um, coat drive. I did one for Thanksgiving and now I have one going on for um, the Christmas holiday and I am partnering with the East Flatbush Community Partnership, and they are a wonderful nonprofit organization that is, um, you know, in their community and really working to get warm winter clothing to those that need that are in need. Another thing I've been doing for the last few years is a jewelry collection, and. Um, I've been reaching out into my community, asking people to go through their old jewelry, through their jewelry boxes, taking out any old jewelry that they don't wear, costume jewelry, polish it up, put it in a box or a Ziploc bag and drop it off at the Eye Green Homestead. And we will be distributing that as well to the East Flatbush Community Partnership and to um, another nonprofit. And these are gifts that people can give to their older children. There's lots of toy drives going on, which is also a wonderful thing to do, but I'm just not taking that on since there are so many organizations doing toy drives. But the jewelry is something that can actually be given to older children. Um, I've even have cufflinks and, um, you know, things that can be for guys as well. So um, if you are in the Long Island area or Queens or Brooklyn or even the city and you want to bring it by the IE Green Homestead, that'd be great. Um, I have a silver van in the driveway that is just sitting there and people can just drop things in there. And I have the truck coming out um, the week of the 20th to pick everything up. So that would be really great. Um, in the news uh, for many weeks, uh, we were writing about the Biden administration in their search for the next USDA secretary. That's the United States Department of Agriculture secretary. And they were thinking about Heidi Heidkamp for a while and got so much pushback from grassroots organizations that they started looking elsewhere. Marsha Fudge was a big... Um, push for many of the grassroots organizations. And now it's just come out that Biden is thinking about reappointing Tom Vilsack for the um, Secretary of Agriculture. And that would be a big mistake. That was the first appointment that Obama made that really had me up in arms thinking, oh no, he's not going to be what I was hoping he would be. And Tom Vilsack was, you know, voted twice governor of the year by the biotech industries. He has, um, you know, certainly does not support organic. He's a big push and propone, um, proponent of GMOs and um, chemicals in agriculture. Um, he has just not done anything good for the department. And we really need someone that is, uh, supporter of organic agriculture and also understands the connection that the Secretary of Agriculture needs to have for protecting the environment, protecting our water and our soil, human health. Um, hunger is a part of the Department of Agriculture. Um, you know, we really just need to push the Biden administration to make a better choice. So Marsha Fudge is at the top of the list of many grassroots organizations. Um, here's a little quote from um, J.D. Hansen, who is the Center of Food Safety's policy director. 
The possible selection of former Secretary Vilsack for President Biden's agriculture secretary is a huge step backwards in our urgent need to support agricultural systems that protect health, the environment, and mitigate the ongoing climate crisis. Um, while he was secretary, he supported chemically dependent industrial agriculture that resulted in millions more pounds of pesticides released into the environment, contaminating our water, soils, and harming human health and wildlife. In addition, during his tenure, the meat industry grew larger and more concentrated, contributing to the climate crisis. Mergers in the meat industry grew larger and larger, even when huge Chinese and Brazilian operations bought up U.S. operations. Bill Sex USDA did not protest. Bill Sex supported the expansion of pesticide promoting genetically engineered crops and was not a strong supporter of organic agriculture. That is not the person we need. So um, please sign petitions. There's lots of petitions going around. Um, I will post one on my website as well at ieatgreen.com. But it's really, really important that we all get involved and take some action in that way. Um, another thing to take action for, we're pushing the president to adopt the Presidential Plastics Action Plan. And this is an action plan that has eight basic highlights. One is um, asking the government to use their buying power to demand alternatives to single use plastic products, to curtail new permits for the production of plastic, to make corporate polluters pay to clean up their messes, to advance environmental justice, to enforce federal regulations to reduce pollution from plastic facilities. Of course, we know that the current administration has weakened all of those regulations. We need to stop subsidizing these plastic producers and join an international effort to address the plastic pollution crisis in our oceans and everywhere. And um, there's also a huge problem with people discarding fishing gear. I didn't even know that. So we need to reduce and mitigate the loss and discarded fishing gear that people just dump into the ocean. So there's a petition on my website for that and I'm asking all of you to please sign it. Um, we just have to stay vigilant. I mean, it's so great that we are going to have a new president in the White House. Um, it's looking more and more sure that um, the current president will not be able to reverse that, even though he keeps trying and stamping his feet like a little baby, um, he is not going to be able to take us down. So I'm really, really happy about that. Um, I want to share with you a new recipe. I actually tried pom, pom fu for the first time. I don't know if you've heard of that, but pom fu is a tofu alternative made from pumpkin seeds. It's just pumpkin seeds and water. And they press it together and it comes out like a block similar to tofu, it has a little greenish tint to it. Um, but I cooked it up and it was really great. And so I made an Asian pumfu vegetable bowl and I'm gonna share that recipe with you now. So you're going to start with one cake of pumfu. Now that's an eight ounce cake. This is good for really just two people. Um, if you are making it for more, I'd get two of the cakes. You know, normal blocks of tofu are a full pound or the, cutting them short now, 14 ounces, to try to cut corners. But, um, you know, I made one cake and it was perfect for my husband and I. And I cut it into cubes similar to tofu um, and pressed it also similar to tofu so that you're taking out the extra water. I cut an onion in half and then sliced it into crescent moons. Two to three carrots. I actually used three because they were really small and skinny, but if you have two larger carrots, that should be fine a head of broccoli cut into florets. Again, you're cooking, this is for two people, so you'd be the judge as to how much you use. I used half a red pepper, one eight ounce um, box of baby bellow mushrooms that I sliced up. You can also quarter them if you prefer. One teaspoon plus one tablespoon minced ginger, one teaspoon plus one tablespoon minced garlic, olive oil for sauteing, two tablespoons of nutritional yeast, one teaspoon plus two tablespoons tamari, one teaspoon plus two tablespoons aji marin. Aji marin I use all the time. For those that don't know, it's a sweet rice wine. And it's really important to know that Eden brand makes a really great quality product where um, Kikoman, the company that makes soy sauce, makes something that they market as mirin. But if you actually look at the ingredients, it's glucose water. 
So it's not the same thing as traditional Aji Marin. So do not buy glucose water. That's just sugar water and that's not what you want. I use two tablespoons of water just to help um, give my dish a little bit more sauce. Half a cup of roasted peanuts, one quarter cup fresh chopped cilantro, sesame seeds for garnish, and I had two cups of cooked um, rice that I served with the bowls. And I made a little sauce on the side. And for that, I used three tablespoons of tahini, three tablespoons of water, one tablespoon aji marin, one tablespoon tamari, another teaspoon of garlic, and another teaspoon of ginger. So like I said before, I first laid the pumfu cubes out on a dry towel and covered them with another towel and pressed lightly to dry them. Then I covered the bottom of a cast iron pan or heavy skillet with the olive oil. When the oil was hot, I added the pomfu. I allowed the pomfu to develop a golden skin by shaking the pan before I turned it over. And that's really key. Um, you really, you know, once it has a golden skin to it, the whether it's tofu or pomfu, it releases from the cast iron pan and then you can easily stir it. If you try to mix it up before that develops, um, the tofu or the pomfu starts to fall apart. So let that skin develop. You can shake the pan if you want to keep it from sticking. Um, and then when, it, when you've gotten that skin, you turn the, each of the cubes over and you're gonna add the minced garlic and the minced ginger. And cook for a few, for a few more minutes until it's golden on the other side. Splash the pomfu with some tamari, a teaspoon or so of tamari and the same of aji marin. And then just shake it so that all of the cubes get covered with that tamari mirin mixture and just set that aside. And then meanwhile, I'm gonna saute the vegetables in a wok. So I covered the bottom of my wok with some more olive oil. That's what I like to saute in, but you can use whatever oil you like to saute in. Um, I thought first added the onions and I cooked those for one minute or so. Then I added the carrots. Then I added the tablespoon of ginger and the tablespoon of garlic and cooked that all for about five minutes until the onions started to get soft and, um, and the same with the carrots, they start to wilt. Then I added the mushrooms and cooked that for about five more minutes added the broccoli and the red pepper. Then I added the nutritional yeast, the tamari and the mirin. And I added two tablespoons of water and that mixing with the nutritional yeast creates a really nice sauce for the dish. And I added the peanuts lastly. I stirred that up, cooked it for just about two minutes so all the flavors come together. Last thing I did was I poured in the, or added the one quarter cup of fresh chopped cilantro. If you are a cilantro hater, which I know some people are, you can of course substitute that with parsley or another herb that you really love. Um, I made a quick sauce on the side, just combining all the ingredients, the tahini, the water, the mirin, the tamari, the garlic, and the ginger. Buzz that up really quickly. And I served this in a bowl. I first put the rice on one side, the vegetables on the other, and then right down the middle, I put the palm fu and I drizzled the sauce I drizzled the sauce just over the rice, but you can drizzle it over the whole thing if you'd like. I garnished it with the sesame seeds and the cilantro and served it with the sesame tahini sauce on the side. And it was delicious and it was so healthy and you just felt like you were eating something that was so good for your body. And so um, I encourage you all to try it. It's always fun to find a new food. And um, this was my new food of the month. So it was really great. One other thing I would just want to share with you, some happy news um, from yesterday that the New York State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli announced that New York State will finally divest $226 billion from its pension fund. I've been part of um, 350.org's Divest New York for years now, and we've been pushing them to divest um, their pension fund, and this is just really great news it will mean that they will be taking the money out of any investments um, from oil and gas companies. And this is really, really great. It will take some time to do that. They're not doing it overnight, but it is definitely a, a change in the right direction. And I'm really, really thrilled to do that. Um, of course, we have the vaccinations 
coming out and that's a whole nother level of discussion that I am not going to address today, but I hope to have a guest on sometime in the near future that can address that because um, it's getting rolled out and people are lining up. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Anyway, I am thrilled to introduce to all of you my guest today. Um, Kendra Pierre Lewis is um, a senior climate reporter with the Gimlet Spotify podcast, How to Save a Planet. Previously, she was the climate reporter for the New York Times and a staff writer for Popular Science, where she wrote about science, the environment, and occasionally mayonnaise. In addition, her writing has appeared in 538, The Washington Post, Newsweek, Auden Farmer, and Slate. Her book, Greenwashed, Why We Can't Buy Our Way to a Green Planet, which came out in 2012, but is so relevant today, um, is what we'll be talking a lot about um, as we get into our conversation. Kendra has an MS in science writing from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Massachusetts and in sustainable development with a focus on policy analysis and advocacy from the Graduate Institute and a BA in economics from Cornell University. She's appeared on C-SPAN and Cheddar, as well as several radio shows, including WNYC's The Takeaway. And today she's joining me. Kendra, are you with me? Hi, I'm with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, my pleasure. And thank you for joining us. I know life is so crazy right now. Um, you know, we were talking about prior to the show, you know, how we're juggling everything and we don't have our normal assistance and our helpers and, you know, and we're doing everything and it's, you know, it's really a challenge. So I really appreciate you taking the time and joining me. Um, I thought, awesome. yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so I thought I wanted to just start back up a little bit and ask you if you could share a little bit about your background, like what drew you to writing about climate change? where that passion come from? I mean, I always wrote from sort of an early age. I was like the, you know, the quiet kid at, at school, like in the back of the classroom writing in her journal. And so there was just kind of that, that was always just sort of a part of my background. It was a thing that I was always doing. I never really thought I would be able to make a career out of writing. Um, when I was in college, I majored in economics um, and climate and environment was kind of a theme of, of something that sort of struck my interest really in college. Okay. Um, I hear you now. You there? Okay, yeah, I'm back. Sorry. My internet connection went unstable. Um, okay. I wasn't sure it was you or me. <laughs> it <laughs> it was me. panicking. Okay. Sorry, can, everyone. Sorry. And I could hear you, which is funny. Um, yeah, I majored in uh, economics and I studied sustainable development and it was just kind of this backdrop of um, consistent interest kind of throughout it was an interest in environment and society. And it was really about, I don't know, eight or nine years ago that I realized I could marry the two. Sort of this thing uh -huh. that I was doing on the side out of my own personal interest, which was writing. And then, you know, I pivoted towards more of a sustainability career and I could marry the two to kind of create something else, which is journalism. Mm -hmm. Well, it's great. You know, people always say that if you do what you love, it feels like you're, you know, never having to work a day in your life. So. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> not it true. definitely <laughs> feels like work sometimes. <laughs> uh-huh. Yes. Um, but a lot of times, you know, at least you're passionate about it, which is yeah. so great. Um, so I wanted to um, start with what was the impetus behind writing the book? Yeah, it's really funny. I was uh, interning actually at a sustainability consulting firm sort of after I'd finished. I'd got, I have two grad degrees sort of so after I'd finished grad school the first time. And um, it was this really beautiful, like green space like lead uh existing building or like commercial building certified and like daylighting and just all of these beautiful touches in it and uh and one of the big touches was they had an on-site kind of like housekeeper from like 8 a.m to 3 p.m to kind of just keep the kitchen clean and some of the other housekeeping things and yet every single person on staff had one of those reusable water bottles but me um and the reason i didn't have one was actually completely practical which was I had kept losing them. I lost something like three in a year and I mm -hmm. cut myself off. I said, you can't buy any more of these. <laughs> like, I don't think it's sustainable for you to continue purchasing and just like leaving them places. I don't think that's how this works. Um, 
And so sitting at work, sort of thinking about this and feeling a lot of like social pressure to get another water bottle because everyone else had one and realizing that like, I actually didn't know. I didn't know if it was better or worse. Like my, my, uh, and I've gotten better since then. I, uh, I now hold on to my water bottles. <laughs> I've had one for, you know, five or six years now. I'm quite proud. Um, uh-huh. But I actually didn't know sort of what was the environmental impact of my behavior. We And I realized that we often very much fixate on the item itself and not like the full way that we use it. And so like, if you have a reusable water bottle, you're green, but if you were treating your reusable water bottle in essence the way that I was treating mine, that is not green behavior. Um, and that kind of got me looking at sort of all of the things and it made me wonder even more about sort of all of the things that we had called green and what was the impact of that behavior? Uh huh. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, you know, one of the lines in your book where you know we're referred to no longer as citizens of the country but consumers. Yeah. You know, you're so right. I mean, you know, I have many times questioned why do the why are we referred to as consumers? And you know, I mean, what what did our president say after nine eleven? Right. Help the economy, go out and go shopping. I mean, you know, you're dealing with a disaster and that's what our, you know, public official is telling us to all do. So, and um, and I think it was, it was especially true. And and we're kind of feeling that right now, right? Like, um, I I really want a taco today. And, uh, and, uh, and I, but I also feel tremendous amount of guilt at the idea of going to a restaurant where, uh, takeout to be clear, where people are essentially risking their lives to make me a taco. But then I'm also like, if I don't buy a taco, then they lose their jobs and they suffer that way because we haven't created a system that allows someone to stay at home. Right. Uh, and 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 that was the sort of, sort of same shame spiral that I'm feeling right now about whether or not I'm buying a taco for dinner tonight. Right. Um, or kind of or that, if you order from DoorDash, right? And then, yeah. you, then you have, you know, these companies going around delivering all over and using gas and whatever. Um, was kind of the same idea that kind of had me thinking about the book, which is this idea that ultimately the way that we, we we had been pushed and we're continually being pushed to go green or to save the planet is solely through the lens of our consumptive behaviors. Uh huh. And right. and I in the book I talk about this moment where I would um a panic that I would have at the supermarket where I couldn't figure out what eggs to buy. Uh (laughs) Um, because I wasn't sure if I should buy the quote unquote, like sustainable eggs that often came wrapped in plastic. Um, you know, but that they were like free range and that chickens had run around or whatever, or if I should buy like the conventional eggs, but they were in a cardboard container. Um, and, and I, I was just like, this isn't a, and it, and by focusing so narrowly on whether or not we are buying the quote unquote right thing it stops us from asking the bigger social questions of is our society sustainable and how do we make our society sustainable within like a climate context, within a green context, even within an economic context, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And and so through the book, what I did with the book was I I targeted specific uh, consumptive behaviors like cars, for example. um, And I looked at like, uh, the ways in which we get so narrowly focused on ca- what comes out of the tailpipe that we don't ask the basic question of like, well, what's the carbon footprint of a road? Mm-hmm. Because we can control what car we buy to a certain degree, you know, assuming income and all of these other factors, um, but you can't control the road and and whether or not you need to buy a car or don't need to buy a car is completely dependent sort of about where you're embedded. You know, I did not own a car in New York City right. because I didn't need to. Right. Mm-hmm. And even during the height of the pandemic, I could still go to the grocery store without a car uh, or even mass transit. Like I could walk myself to the supermarket, you know? Right. Um, and that isn't true everywhere. Right. Right. And you talk about the carbon footprint of the road, but you know, there's it goes beyond that. What about the carbon footprint of the fracked gas that they spray on the roads to de-ice it? You know, they make de-icer now from the wastewater, from you know, waste yeah. not just the wastewater, the waste chemicals from fracking. And you so, know, what does that do to the land? 
Right. And so if we start asking these questions and we realize like, oh, we probably need to have fewer roads, what does it look like as a society to live in harmony with each other in a way that has fewer roads? And like nobody's arguing and I'm not arguing uh, that, um, you know, we all go back to living um, in caves or anything, but like the Detroit suburbs, for example, had a massive suite of road building sort of over the, like from 2000 to 2010, and there wasn't a large population increase. It was just more people living further and further apart from each other. And that has a huge carbon footprint, right? So like there are ways, um, there are ways to live a quote unquote modern life um, that have higher and lower carbon footprint. And we know that easily, like you look at the carbon footprint of your, the average person in the United States versus the carbon footprint of the average person in Europe. And that is completely structural, right? Like it's not that Europeans are suddenly better humans than we are. It's just that the ways in which they've crafted their cities are very different than the ways we've crafted ours. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> but there's still people that live rurally, you know, out in the country and, you know, you know, you're yeah. not going to have mass transit out in, out mm -hmm. in a more mm -hmm. rural area. And I think, especially now with, um, the ability to not have to work in a city now that we people are realizing and discovering you can actually work remotely. Um, this is going to be a whole new paradigm that we're going to be dealing with. Well, you know, believe it or not, like in the early days of like rural America, <laughs> um, they actually had trolleys that went to rural areas and they didn't run, you know, they ran less often. Um, but like, if you are living in a rural area, which I've actually done, you're not going into town in the same way that a person in city is like sort of navigating that space. So having some form of mass transit that maybe runs once an hour, um, so you can get into town and do grocery and run errands and then get out of town, is it's still feasible. Mm -hmm. Right. But and, and what you, we've you know and I know we're not going to go back to that. Once you've, once you've tasted this, you know, our reality, um, you know, we have to, we have to find other ways, but I don't foresee people, you know, giving up cars at any time in the near future. I mean, they were though, I mean, at least not <clears throat> widely, but, but pre-pandemic, the pandemic sort of changed a lot of people's behaviors. A lot of people, a lot of younger people were not buying cars at any way near at the rates of previous generations. Uh-huh. Because we had Ubers and um, yeah, because, you know, uh, a, a family member lives in, you know, uh, Atlanta and does not know how to drive mm -hmm. and has oriented her life around not being able to drive. Um, and, you know, she uses Lyft to get around when she needs to. She lives actually, Atlanta has a mass transit system. So she lives near the mass transit system and she's able to get around without driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know my mother-in-law, you know, she's... Um, she lives in California and she had a car, but you know, she's 90 now and driving's not so safe for her and she doesn't drive that much. And so it became much more cost effective to just Uber where she needed to go rather than have a car and pay the insurance and pay for the repairs and all that for when she needed to go to the store. And so um, and, and, she's and not really driving it now, but now with Ubers, you know, people don't want to get in the car with an Uber person mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. But I think, I mean, we're living through exceptional times, <laughs> good <Right>. and bad. <laughs> um, and so I think uh, the thing that I'm trying to be careful of, and I think was, that we all kind of need to be aware of is that like the behaviors that we're exhibiting right now are hopefully not fixed. <laughs> uh, I would like to be able to go outside again. Um, <laughs> yeah, we all would, right? Uh, so like, I, I think we should be careful about establishing norms based on um, an unprecedented, unprecedented and infection and actually one of the things that's really funny is in new york city um it's it's this trope or this joke that like um buildings are just too hot they're overheated um and 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 most large apartment buildings sort of have a, a central steam uh boiler that uh and steam heat and it turns out that the reason new york city apartments are just like so hot and like why you will go through new york city and like see people with windows open in december or january is because of the 1918 flu. They deliberately designed buildings to be overheated so that they could keep the windows open and stay warm to allow it for air circulation to reduce infection. Um, so, really? yeah, so it's kind of funny. Like, so, I mean, it's not, so like this horribly inefficient system, like from an energy perspective was a pandemic response. Wow, wow. 
no idea because you always you always think like what a waste you know everybody because that's a typical thing everyone has to have their windows open in the winter because the heat is just ridiculous and how much they're wasting yeah and i'm not saying we we clearly we we need to fix it (laughs) and there are other and we we know better ways of ventilation now um but it is often helpful to think about like well why did you create that in the first place and that's kind of why um Mm -hmm. and yeah and and in the book it, it's really trying to push people to kind of systems thinking and not just thinking so concretely and so narrowly about do I buy this brand of coffee or that brand of coffee but kind of getting people to this middle space where like you feel reasonably okay about your patterns and behaviors you know like so I you know this is dumb but like I don't use or I try to not to use plastic bags when I go to the supermarket I try and remember bring my own bag Mm-hmm. And that's pretty baked in. I used to live, um, I briefly lived in France and in France, they haven't had like plastic bags at the supermarket forever. And the idea essentially is that like, figure out what your line in the sand is. Like, what are the things that you think are important and that you can just sort of set it and forget it. And then kind of devote your attention to these sort of bigger systemic problems. Because we know that individual action has a limited impact on changing climate change or slowing climate change that we need sort of big systemic changes um to make that happen Mm -hmm. and that requires people to actually become involved in policy and in um government and you know local government you know because a lot of things that happen on the local level you know if you can't feel like you can really make a change on the you know in the state and federal level um, the local level is where a lot of things happen, you know, in your own town, whether mm-hmm. you, they allow leaf blowers, you know, I mean, not only noise pollution, but the, yeah. the pollution from that or, um, you know, or whether they de-ice the roads with fracking waste or, you know, those are things that I know on Long Island, they don't allow the de-icing with fracking waste because we have the aquifers here. Mm. Um but they do allow all the fertilizers, the nitrogen fertilizers, and we still have the aquifers. So it doesn't make <laughs> sense. So who's buying who out? You know, it's always a question about that. Um, let's take a couple minute break. And when we come back, I'd really like to talk about, I know in your book, you touch on an industry that most people don't really think about um, in your book. So, um, and the impact that that has. So everyone don't go anywhere. I'm talking with um, Kendra Pierre Lewis about her book, Greenwashed. Be right back. This is Dr. Cheryl Selman, and I'm the host of What Women Must Know, every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. As a naturopathic doctor and psychotherapist, I am always seeking the latest solutions to help you rejuvenate and regenerate your body, mind, and spirit. So join me, Dr. Cheryl, and my inspiring guests, authors, health practitioners, and wise elders to empower yourself by expanding your knowledge about your health and your hormones and to gain fresh new perspectives on life. That's What Women Must Know every Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Listen to PRN to learn all the ways that nonviolence is the only way to counter violence. Only on PRN.FM do you get the complete picture of progressive the Progressive Radio Network. Get ready for an outstanding entertainment program. The Jimmy Dore Show. The Democrats are a grassroots party the same way Monsanto is an organic food company. We should do a diet where we just make fun of the Democratic Party. But it's important to respect the dead. (laughs) And everyone is still saying you got to vote for it. Because Trump did you got to beat Trump with something. Where's your platform for ending the seven wars Barack Obama got us in? Where's your platform for ending fracking? Where's your f***ing platform? Every Thursday evening at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Radio Network. God bless you, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> what is in the COVID vaccine? Uh, just a little mRNA. MRNA. Learn about MRNA on the Gary Knoll Show with Gary Knoll. MRNA on PRN.FM. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. If you're just joining us, 
My guest today is Kendra Pierre-Lewis. She's the author of a great book called Greenwashed, and I am thrilled to have her here. And you're listening to Bhavani at I Eat Green. Kendra, uh, Thank before you for the having break- me. Sure. I'm so happy. Um, before the break, I wanted to touch on um, an industry that you touch on in your book that people don't really think we have an impact on. And I think people don't fully understand. Can you elaborate on that? Um, I actually don't. I feel like you're being so coy that I'm not sure that I know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, is there an industry in particular where you think um, where you think people can have an impact that they, where they don't really fully understand. Are you referencing food waste? Yeah. Yeah. Um, It's really funny because we get into all of these debates about what we should be eating, but really the easiest and most straightforward thing that you can do is to just don't throw your food out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Buy what you consume, what you buy. We throw out something like a third of the food that we bring home. Uh Uh-huh. Um, and then, and that's on top, of course, other industry waste. So um, a lot of stuff just doesn't make it to market because of reasons. But yeah, a huge one is just simply food waste. It's a, a significant um, source of carbon emissions, partly because of the waste itself, um, but also because of everything it takes to produce this food that we then throw out. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I've touched on food waste a lot, and you know, it's not it's not only the food that's being wasted but it's all the resources that went into creating that food that I think people don't even connect it to, you know, it's, it's the land, it's the labor, it's the transportation. I mean, the footprint of that food is huge. So it's not just, you know, what it's going to do once it gets to the landfill and and, um, create methane, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually also all the resources that are being wasted that went into creating that food. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, funny because I think, uh, I'm unstable again. I think, um, it, it, it ties to this other value of frugality that I don't think that I think it's, it's, it's funny. I, I should say this. I said, I'm like, you know, I've been around so long, but I think that, that, um, that has kind of been lost. Right. Um, because so much of our, our culture is disposable. Like so much of what we buy is not designed anymore to be fixed. Um, so much is disposable that I think we don't, it just, we don't think about what it takes to bring something to us because so much of what we purchase is disposed of so rapidly. And I Mm -hmm. think that kind of ties into food waste where we don't, because many of us don't work on farms anymore. We don't actually really understand the, the labor that it entails to like bring you an apple. Right. Right. It's so true. Um, you know, and you just touched on, they make everything to be disposable. I mean, I, you know, I have these chaise lounges up on my pool and some of the material broke. So it's like, well, the, the chair is still good. Let me just get the slats to replace it. Well, the slats were like almost as much money as the chair itself. And the yeah. chair did have some rust and whatever. And then I would have to, I, I actually, I still, because it was greener, I still bought it. Well, it took me hours, almost days to replace it. It was not an easy fix. And it was like, okay, well, you know, for the amount of time it took, it would have been so much easier to just throw it out and get a new one. Um, and it's, you know, it's frustrating that they don't make things with quality the way they, they used to. I mean, I still have my grandmother's blender that works great, you know, and, um, you know, you could buy a Vitamix for, you know, $300 or $400 mm-hmm. and it's not going to last, you know, the 60 years that my grandmother's blender has lasted. Yeah. And it's interesting. Um, there've been a number of what they call right to repair legislation. And it's a lot of it is focused on electronics and e-waste um, for that reason. Um, and also the automobile industry, which is essentially the idea that when somebody purchased something, they actually have a they should have the legal ability to fix it because um, often what was happening is you're creating, and you, you'll see this with cars, like your car will not um, send a warning of some kind. And then you have to take it to a mechanic to hook it up to a computer to understand what's wrong with it, right? 
-hmm. And so it's these kind of black box systems that are very difficult for people to crack. And so the only way to fix it is to often take it to like a certified or an authorized dealer. So like a random mechanic can't fix it if they haven't paid for this proprietary software. And so there's a lot. And so oftentimes, you know, it, it sounds insane, but I actually had a friend buy a new car because the mechanic essentially told her, we don't know what's wrong with your car and it will probably, it could be nothing or it could be quite expensive. Um, <laughs> And it will be very expensive for us to figure out what's wrong with it. You might be, it's now at a point where you might just be better off to buy a new one. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, it's crazy. It's wild. Yeah. Um, and you see that time and time again, where things are either, and, you know, I fix it actually is a huge champion on this, where things are just not designed to be fixed. And so when you try to fix them, uh, I actually had this issue with a printer. The, the printer is fine. It had a uh, it had a clogged print head and I spent hours trying to fix it. And then ultimately I, I successfully took it apart, but I couldn't get it back together again because it was never designed to be disassembled. And I, and I had to give up and I was so irritated and mad because the, you know, there's nothing wrong with it <laughs> except mm -hmm. for the fact. Um, uh, and, and now, and, and I know what it takes to make it, but I had to buy a new printer because we're in a pandemic and, I am not going to go to the store every time I need to print something. Right. Right. And even printers that very often they make them so cheap that, you know, they give them out free when you buy something else, you know, you buy you know, the computer, they give you the printer for free. Which um, is wild because like, you know, so I went looking for printers and I wanted one that had a scanner in it. And when you think about the level of, if you go back 30 years, having a machine that could, essentially a photocopying machine in your home would have cost like thousands and thousands of dollars. When you think about how little um, a printer costs, even like in the, these all-in-one printer costs and how much like intellect and how much material, you know, needs to go in to make that thing work. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's mind boggling to me. Yeah, yeah. It really is, you know, but that's where, again, policy plays such a big part of it, because um, I know in Europe, for instance, there is a law that I think all cell phones have to have the same plug and they work year after year, the same plug. So every time you get a cell phone, you don't have to get a new plug. Apple not only changes the plug, but they change the plug from year to year for their own phones, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm, it's so frustrating. And every time Apple comes out with a new thing, you need a new a new charger over here, a new charge, you know, the chargers are all um, unified in Europe so that they don't have all this e-waste. And that is policy. And that's about, you know, making choices for the planet. And our government keeps making choices for, for business owners. You know, they make choices that require us to become consumers and buy more. I mean, it's all set up that way. So, you know, you, you know, you touch on so many of these things in your book, how we're, you know, they have us trapped in this buying frenzy, even when you don't want to buy something, you kind of have to, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because um, at my last job, I was working on a story. I, I wrote a story about, um, and I talk, I talk, I talk on like the impact on of fashion in the book. And it's a, a topic that I think about kind of continually and it's kind of always on my mind and um, at one of the, you know, we were getting a lot of emails from people asking us to talk about fashion, talk about fashion. And, and I very much felt like, I don't want to say it had been done, but I mean, there had been a lot of reporting on sort of the impact of the fashion industry, but obviously nothing uh -huh. has changed. And I was like, we often tell people, I was like, this is actually one arena where people's behavior can have an impact, but the behavior that people often think that they should be doing, like I should only buy organic clothes or I should only buy a green brand or something like that, is not actually the correct behavior. The behavior is buy things that are durable and then don't buy them that often. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So buy better, but buy fewer. And and I was like, and I'm, you know, I'm not, and, and I was like, but the question is like, how do you know, how do you buy better? What is the sign of better? And, and We've all had that experience where like, um, I bought a, I just got a new pair of hiking boots and the boots that they replaced were 10 years old. And when I went to go and rebuy the sort of the same boots <laughs> that, that I'd finally worn out, I discovered that, 
you know, in the intervening 10 years, the brand had sort of shifted on in its quality and the new boots that they had just weren't sort of up to snuff. So like we, and I feel like we've all had that experience where like a brand that we trusted and loved in the past had shifted in some way and we, and wasn't as durable and wasn't as great. And so we ended up creating a guide for people on how to identify clothing that was durable. And it was kind of like a, like, you know, like one of the things was like tuck lightly on the seams because, um, things that are poorly constructed will often kind of, you can, the seams will kind of come apart visually and you can see it. And it was also really helpful, I think, because it hit all price points. So like, if you are hitting up the thrift shops, the guide worked. If you are hitting up the mall, the guide worked. Like, like, like it was like value agnostic. It didn't matter where you were shopping. Where's it this was, guide? Well, tell me about the, this it's guide. On, it's on the New York Times website. It was a, how to, I think it was like, how to buy clothes made to last. Hello, hello. hello? Ah, there you are. Okay, yeah, I lost it, it for a few moments. Yeah, it always tells me that it went unstable after, <laughs> uh-huh. not before. When I get okay. that warning, it's no longer unstable. <laughs> right, well, um, good. But yeah, but that's kind of the one, there are like a few things where I think your individual behaviors can make a difference. And I think just as a rule of thumb, generally buying less is generally uh, the preferred thing um, to do whenever possible. But I think broadly speaking that we know that we need to like green the electric grid and and, like there are all of these other things that kind of require everyone to kind of take part and that's a lot of what we talk about on the podcast I think you know Greta I think and like a lot of the the youth climate activists they say all are welcome all are needed is kind of their their slogan and and I think that there's as an individualistic society there's this real big push to try and fix it individually and I think we need to come together Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's so many grassroots out there doing great work and they also need to come together so that we become a bigger voice and not so many, (laughs) you know, because sometimes, you know, it's hard to split your energies in so many different ways. And so many people are trying to work on the same thing. It would be really great if we could all come together, even within the um, grassroots movements. So what is the biggest takeaway that you'd like people to get from your book? Um, I really, I I think the biggest takeaway is to automate sort of your consumption to kind of, you know, do the best that you can within a reasonable limit, within your own reasonable limitations. Like that could be economic, that could be, you know, time, that could be, um, you know, whatever it is. And then, and then, and then really devote your energy to sort of one of these bigger, more collective solutions. And that could be something as simple as like going to your school board meetings and pushing for climate education in the curriculum. Um, it could be running for public office. Like you get to, that's kind of the exciting thing is you you get to kind of figure out what, where you think you can make an entry into that point, but, but not to be so narrowly focused on individual behavior, on individual consumer behavior to really rethink it about yourself as being a person within society and figuring out how to socialize that and uh uh uh, not in a (laughs) how to make that like a more social behavior and to how to bring bring and to connect with other people Mm -hmm. um another thing you touch on or not touch on but you talk about quite a bit in the book is biodiversity Mm -hmm. and you know you know that's something that i am just so um concerned about you know the biodiversity that took millennia to develop you know we are as you say eradicating um the natural balance that you know that we've depended on for so long um and we really need to make a change and it's been you know the four years of having a president that denies climate change is even happening has been really horrible and Um, you know, I think we all welcome some fresh blood so that we can get back on track. Um, what, what have you seen? What are some of the changes that you've seen since you've, um, written the book? I mean, the book is from 2012. So much of it is still relevant today. And yet a lot has changed. We have made some headway since 2012. Um, can you share with us how the landscape's changed? Yeah. I mean, from, like from an energy perspective, I think we're a little bit more hopeful and optimistic on like pivoting to renewable energy, which is good. We're seeing a lot around um, 
honestly, like the biggest change and has been the oil industry, right? Like, and that has been a sea change in like the last three months um, because of the pandemic oil prices collapsed. And there's like New York City actually just yesterday divested, has pledged to divest its pension fund from fossil fuels. I know. know. And that's like a conversation that a decade ago, you would have been like on the fringes and kind of like, a little bit of a wackadoodle to say like we should divest from fossil fuels and now it's like the norm it is a thing that people have kind of come to the realization that like owning these these stocks owning stocks in these companies it's like hot potato and someone's going to be left holding these stranded assets and you don't want it to be you right and at the same time some of the oil companies not i forget which one some of them are actually making a commitment to try to invest money in alternative energies and starting to make the transition over because they know it's the way of the future. So and then I, there's others that are just digging in their heels going, we're not changing. I think with the oil companies, we need to be careful in particular because um, one uh, uh, one company that has made that pledge has actually made that pledge before in the past and invested very little in renewable energy. And then as soon as sort of like they made that pledge and people stopped looking at them, actually, sold it. So that's what BP did leading up to the, before the BP oil spell, they made all of the, you know, that was their rebranding. They said beyond petroleum, um, instead of British petroleum, they like created the green logo, the the logo with the sun. They said, we're going to invest in solar. And they invested, I think like 30 million, maybe it was 30 million, but you know, relative to their bottom line, a, a small amount of money. Um, and then shortly after the BP oil spill, they divested from it. So they had a massive oil spill and the reaction to that was to divest from solar energy. Yeah. And so yeah. I think with these companies that are making these commitments, I'm not saying that they're not true. I'm just saying that like, we need to wait and see if they're true. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, so many, you know, your title of your book is greenwashing and that's, you know, something that these big corporations are so good at doing. I mean, your book is really not all about greenwashing, but <laughs> That's something that we all have to watch out for all across the board with these companies that, you know, are doing something really bad and they, you know, put some energy into and a lot of PR into publicizing the one little thing that they're doing that's good um, to try to, you know, neutralize all the bad that they're doing. Um, doesn't really work. Yeah. Um, and so how does the research you've done with Greenwash connect with the um, journalism you're doing now and the podcast you're doing now? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in, at the core, the podcast is about climate solutions and the book is sort of the same thing. And I think what it has, the research that it's done, it has really made me very clear about knock-on effects and really cautious about what we tell people is a climate solution. And then uh, I, I don't want to say, uh, and, and, and skeptical really, and, and in a good way, like I try to, we try to be very cautious and thoughtful about what we, the actions that we tell people might have a benefit um, for that reason, because there's nothing worse than thinking that you're doing something good and then turning around and discovering that you're, you did something actually harmful. Um, and so I think mm-hmm. a lot of the research and a lot of the thought in that, and, and in the our podcast itself, we often think past individual solutions to like social solutions. So we often are telling people what they can do on in, in their community or how to engage in their communities for that reason. Mm-hmm. And what about um, diet? Do you, do you touch on, you know, one thing that I have found in my research is it seems like, you know, the production of meat adds so much to the climate crisis and it's something that we don't that people don't really want to talk about because nobody really wants to draw attention to meat consumption because nobody wants to have to reduce that Can i mean we're, touch we're, on that? we're working on an episode about meat and that question but one of the things that i often think is really interesting is that we focus a lot on diet but we don't focus a lot on ag and there's a limit to how much when you look at how ag is done um how it's financed there is a limit to how much individual okay so a really good example is the united states that is out a tremendous amount of milk every year um like like there's like a bananas amount of milk and and the end it's this parallel situation where we're disposing of this tremendous quantity of milk but at the same time 
dairy farmers are quite often struggling financially. Um, so we're producing milk and we're throwing it out and the farmers themselves are not making a living. And that is completely <laughs> structured around policy. Um, that is why we are overproducing milk. Is Okay. Um, talking about the disposing of milk, you know, that was a huge issue at the beginning of this pandemic. We all heard about um, how much milk was being thrown out. And I, um, I can hear you now. Yeah. We're yeah. And, and that's not a pandemic thing. That is just like, it is a fundamental structure of policy and no amount of changing your diet is going to under undo that system. And so I, it, this gets back to the individual question, right? Which is like, what should I eat instead of what should our system be producing? And we don't, and because we're so separated from farmers, we don't have that conversation. Right. And that's why, going back to Tom Vilsack, that's why we need a secretary of agriculture that cares about these things, that really will look at the systemic problems within the system because we need big systemic change. You know, I'm on the board of the Northeast Organic Farming Association, and I know how many um, organic dairy farmers are struggling and farmers in general are struggling. And, you know, it used to be where a quarter of our population were farmers. You know, we needed farmers to grow our food. And now it's like 1% of the you know, it, not even that, I don't think. I mean, so few produce the food that we eat and so much of it is, you know, not by um, small family farmers, it's these big agricultural corporations that really don't give a hoot about the quality of the food. Um, so the whole thing, or the quality of the soil or any of that. So like you said, big systemic change needs to happen. Yep. So I want to thank you. We're just about out of time. Um, I love your book. Um, thank you so much for writing it and for your work with the podcast. I'm going to tune in, everyone. How to Save a Planet. Tell people how do they find How to Save a Planet. Uh, we're available on Spotify and everywhere you can find podcasts. Wonderful. So Spotify, Apple Music, all of it. Yeah. Thank you great. so much for having me. You're welcome. Everyone out there, have a great rest of the week. Try the Palm Fu recipe. I think you'll like it and I will see you all again next week. Bye for now.